from tapes, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Sunday morning, June the 28th, 1981, Lake Hamilton Bible Camp Summer Family Camp Meeting. Uh, Frank Mandola is the teacher of the morning, subject a false balance. But when the saints go marching in, and when they crown him king of kings, and when they crown him king of kings, oh, I want to be in that number. Oh, when they crown him king of kings, hallelujah. And when the saints go marching in, Oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, I want to be in that number. And when the saints go marching in. Okay, you stay right where you are. All of you look at one another. Join hands. Join hands. We're going to call down a supernatural blessing upon Camp Lake Hamilton. And I feel the spirit of praise, the spirit of worship, the spirit of Almighty God is here this morning. And we're not going to leave just going home with a blessing. We're going to come here to decree one. Can you say amen? Okay. I'm going to need a very short prayer. And then if you got your prayer language, you pray and we're going to break through this morning. Father, in Jesus' name, you know that this is an outpost, God, for people. It's a refuge to come, Lord God, to get the nourishment that the churches cannot provide. Lord, I ask you to, to bless this place, Camp Lake Hamilton, in Jesus' name. Bless its leaders, bless its staff. Have them come into perfect unity in one mind and one accord, that your Holy Spirit can fall here, even as I did on the day of Pentecost, Lord God. And that they will never have to worry about want or money, but every time they come together, the Lord would provide and even, of course, supply for his riches in Christ Jesus, so there'll be no lack and no want. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we decree blessings to fall upon this place in the name of Jesus. Okay, people pray. who says we can't get drunk before nine o'clock in the morning hallelujah but it's drunk on the spirit and the wine that jesus makes glory you can go back to your seats god bless you i can just want to tell you this we never did this in a catholic church <laughs> And some of you could probably say, well, brother, in fact, we never did it in the Baptist church either. Wouldn't Mother Superior be surprised? I want to tell you something. I was never a sow puss before I got saved. I don't intend to be one after I got saved. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Okay. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, it's one of these things where you don't know what to do. The Lord's doing something. I don't know if I should get him preach. Go sit down and do what? You know? Oh, Hallelujah. Well, we'll just continue. Lord, if you want to interrupt, be perfectly free. The Holy Spirit's running this, not me. Hallelujah. We're going to finish up today on you know, what we started yesterday and which we couldn't finish. And uh, before we get into the last part of uh, those, <clears throat> of the last type of curses, uh, by the way, how many of you are convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that curses are real. Raise your hand. How many of you who are convinced got free of some yesterday? Look at that. Just keep your hands up. What if I turn around and start looking? Amen. We better come into this revelation if we're going to get set free. And I'll tell you, I'll expound on that a little bit more later on. But I'll just give you a hint as to what we're going to talk about. I've been going around. Other preachers have been going around calling out spirits of murder, anger, lust, and all this. And when they come out, you know. But yet there's a bigger picture than just calling out spirits of lust, murder, bitterness, and resentment, and all this. There is 
a hierarchy in Satan's kingdom that we better start getting to pulling down some strongholds. This is just some little stuff down here, as you're going to see in a moment. But boy, we need to graduate very quickly if we're going to start pulling down strongholds. Amen. So, I thank God for the revelation. And I'll tell you this. God really had the people who came to me in private counseling. I really believe with all my heart that the people who came to me and to Brother Jim Shrum right here, that the people we ministered to were put there by the Lord so we could obtain the revelation of what to break for you. Because what we broke yesterday, I've really never broken before. So you can see how fresh that word was, how fresh that revelation was, and you have to thank the Holy Spirit of God for leading these saints to me and to this brother so we could obtain that revelation and bring the fresh rhema word of God to you, and as a result, look how many of you got free. Isn't that beautiful? It's not something I dreamt up seven years ago or six months ago. It was something that happened this week. And just think how beautiful that all of us were privy to enter into it. I can't think of a greater thing. It's like we're here, the battle is being sounded, and we're right there to get the latest information. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, very briefly, if you remember, we discussed four types of curses. Category A, those pronounced by invocation through a prayer, calling upon a supernatural power, can be produced by A, evil people, B, just people. There are just curses and there are evil curses. We gave examples of the two. Elisha, if you remember, was one of those who set in our definition as men of God, causing the just judgment of God to fall upon the unrighteous or disobedient when he called the two sheep bears out of the woods, cursed those children who says, go up thou bald head, bald head, right? He cursed them in the name of the Lord. The sheep bears came out and did what they had to do. We gave some other examples of just curses in the word of God. Joshua was an example. When he destroyed Jericho, and then he cursed the man who built it, the youngest and oldest son died according to the scripture fulfillment of 1 Kings 16.34. Okay. Then we went on yesterday to, to tell you a little bit more about how curses could be re, uh, produced. And the main one is disobedience to the law of God. Deuteronomy 28, Malachi 3. If we don't meet the conditions, not only do we not inherit the blessings, we inherit a curse. We talked about Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal as the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River. And they came through the valley uh, where the town of Shechem was uh, going to be built in the future. And on one side was the Mount of Blessing, the other side was the Mount of Cursing. Well, we read that there's just as many curses as there are blessings. Amen. Probably more. And if we don't meet the conditions to inherit the blessings, we will certainly inherit the curses. So, we went into that quite a bit and we gave many examples of that. We talked about tithing. That if we don't tithe, that not only is, are we not going to be blessed, but we're going to be subject to a curse. Then we talked about objects. And we went into a lot of things about objects. Statues, frogs, owls, the whole bit. Uh, A-track tapes, cassette tapes, jewelry. And we talked a little bit about the uh, Chaldean word for iniquity, and it's spelled A-V-O-N, praise God. Uh, Brother Glenn came up to me and says that uh, the, the uh, firm that's putting out uh, the perfume uh, under the name of Machiavelli in Italian means warlock. Is that right? Warlock. Interesting. Be very discerning next time you pick up some perfume. And we talked about how curses over objects don't have to be the object itself. We talked about the coconut owls, right? Okay. Where it just was a coconut carved into the face of an owl, some type of curse was put on it, and therefore did its evil work. We talked about the ring, which is not itself evil, but yet the pronouncement that went over the ring carried the curse. And in fact, any object can be evil. We talked about, the, you know, and this is where you have to be open to the Holy Spirit. What about my Catholic friend who received the rosary beads that were made in Haiti and had the uh, pronouncement over it? Now, not all rosary beads carry, let's say, necessarily a curse that this one did, but this had a pronouncement built right into it. We talked about eight, uh, hard rock. We know that hard rock has the voodoo rhythm beat. Uh, there are some uh, Christian ministers and deliverance who believe that uh, there are covenants 
who are called in to play invocation over the hard rock music. So it's like a box of Cracker Jacks when you go buy the album. You know, you get a free surprise with everyone. Amen. Right. We talked a little about poltergeist manifestations, that if you have doors slamming, um, doorbells ringing, uh, record players go on by themselves and weird things like this, it's usually caused by an object in the home. We talked about my experiences in Canada, which is very hair-raising, which God used to bring forth much revelation. Okay. What to do with them? Destroy them by fire. That's the scriptural way. The scriptures we used was Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 25 and 26, and Acts 19, 19. All right, that brings us up to date on the last subject we'll discuss today. And after this, we'll go into some questions and answers. This is your last time to ask any questions, so we'll give you an opportunity. We'll go into some of the revelation that God's given us in Breaking Curses this week, and I'll explain very briefly why we have categorized the demon grouping list, as we have done, that you can get in the, in the back by the bookstore, by the book table. Okay. Category D, curses produced by out-of-balance teachings. Now, I'll tell you people, when I came to this, it's not something you run to your average Fundy church or to your average Pentecostal church and start shouting from the rooftops. It's something you need to seek the Lord about in your private prayer closet because this was heavy. Lord, a curse by out-of-balance teachings? You're really going to have to show me this morning. And as usual, like I said before, I'm not here preaching a sermon for my intellect. In fact, there was a prophecy over me saying, I'm going to do a change in your ministry. What kind of change, Lord? Now, you've got to appreciate the sense of humor in all this. Here I am with a college degree, Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, studied four hard years to make it through, burning the midnight candle, elbow greasing it from 1, 2 o'clock in the morning almost every night. My parents are in bed, but I'm still working on my homework. It was tough. So what does the world tell you to do? Make it through the world yourself. Rely on that intellect. And that's what comes mind idolatry. So the prophecy was said to me along these lines. I'm going to do a change in your ministry, and you will not rely on your intellect. Lord, is that you? But I will cause you to pass through the very thing that I want you to experience, and then as a result of that, you will preach it. And do you know what a change that's made in this ministry? I'm not here preaching what other preachers are preaching. I'm preaching what I myself and my wife have experienced for ourselves, and that brings such a good witness to everything that the Lord shows me in the Word. Because what do people do when they experience something from the Lord? They testify, don't they? And that's the whole message. To experience the Lord and testify of Him. Well, be that as it may, it was my wife that was used by the Lord to experience this last curse. And we were in several churches. I'm not going to name names. You don't have to know who they are. But, you know, churches have their own particular idiosyncrasies. They're caught up, uh, usually, on one main theme. Whether it be the rapture, whether it be once saved, always saved, brother. Whether it be not once saved, always saved, brother. Whether it be faith and confession or victory. They've all got it out of balance. And what did we say? What was Proverbs 11.1 1, that we started with this off the other day? That's right. Someone learned their lesson. A false balance is an abomination before the Lord. Now, we applied that scripture to our personality, and that's why we drew the big eye and the small eye. And some of you had a lot of from the small eye and a lot from the big eye. But now let's take that same scripture and apply it to the teachings from Almighty God. If we take the teachings and are always reading from the same text, with no different insight, not pulling things, from the other word of God, we have, in fact, out-of-balance teaching. Well, what was the result of this out-of-balance teaching? All right? We went to one church. And his message one Sunday morning was victory. That's good. Boy, it's good to hear a message on victory. There's a lot of people who've been so down in the, in the ground, they're dragging their jaws on the cement as they walk down the sidewalk. They need to hear some victory in their lives. They need to hear that Jesus has won the victory, and we're here just to forward it. Amen. 
Well, the next day we came, we heard a message on victory. Well, it was good. The next time we came, we had a message on victory. All right. Next Sunday we went, victory. Victory. Hey, wait a minute. There's got to be more in the word besides victory, victory, victory. Where's the message, for instance, of suffering? A dirty word in the charismatic renewal. Or call it whatever you want. Charismania. A dirty word. And in the church where they're preaching victory, there's no suffering. Hello? Now we know that when storms come our way, it's perfectly scriptural to stand and rebuke them. Right? However, when storms come, it's perfectly scriptural to endure them. And when storms come, it's perfectly scriptural to hide from them. I got a, I got a three-hour teaching of that. I can't go into it. But what I'm trying to show you is that if we select just those scriptures that fit our own personality and character, guess what we have? Out of balance. Now, think what that has meant in the charismatic movement. And brother, I got, a, I got a pain right here. Could you pray for that? Okay, we'll pray for it. Doesn't go away. Hmm. We rebuked it. Why did it go? Amen. Come back next Sunday. We pray for it. Pain's still there. Of course, if we found out that the person had bitterness and resentment against somebody, we could pray now till Jesus comes and that thing would still be there. And you know something? The message for that person was you're going to endure for a while until you learn the lesson of forgiveness. So what have we done? We've tried to forward the, the message of rebuking, which you should have learned the message of enduring until repentance and godly sorrow. And then the time will come for rebuke and to be set free. And there's where the mayhem comes in the charismatic movement. Well, what effect did this have on me and my wife? Well, I'm rather one of a strong spirit. And I want to tell you something very seriously. Everything that affects someone else does not have to affect someone else. Women are more prone to picking up demon spirits than men. We found that out in Canada. That's why they need a covering. It's called a husband. Now, if they don't have a husband, they got other coverings. Read it in James. It says that pure religion and undefiled is to take care of the widows and orphans. James is speaking to the church. Not to welfare. Not to the food stamp service. To the church. And that is their covering. Now, you know me well enough to know what I'm not talking about this discipleship thing. Where we uh, uh, can't go to the bathroom until we check with our elder. I'm not talking about that. But there is a balance there. They had a good message, but it got perverted. It got, can I say the word, out of balance? Right. Okay. So what the effect did this produce on my wife and me? On me, it grieved me. I mean, it grieved me. Because I knew the message of Almighty God is not just uh, found in Mark 11, 23 and 24. Confess it and you've got it, brother. There's other messages. Well, my wife starts having problems. So we sat down one night. So what's the problem? She said, I feel I need deliverance. Well, I've delivered you before. How can you need more deliverance? Well, I need deliverance. Sure enough, she did. Now, my wife... Now, my wife doesn't manifest in the usual way. You know, some manifest with a, a twitch, some with a cough, some with a burp. But when my wife manifests and I call it out, all I see is that I told you there was no formulas. You didn't believe me. And that's how I know the silly spirit's gone. And we pulled out a whole bunch when we left this particular church. And it wa then we said, well, why? We didn't understand the secret. Where's the key? Where's the key, Lord? We're walking in the spirit. We love you. We pray in tongues. We seek your face. How can we pick up these things? Don't know. So we go to another church. Well, what's, what's your message? Faith. Oh, that's good. Faith and confession. That's good. Faith and confession. Good. Faith and confession. Hey, wait a minute. What's going on here? Every sermon is faith and confession. Every sermon is uh, going up to Goliath and ripping off his head? Come on, there's got to be more than that. Where's the message of repentance? Where's the message of contriteness, of brokenness, of weeping before the Lord, of praying through? Where is it? Don't 
Not in this church. We're a faith church. Nice, brother. What else do you have? How about love? What? Oh, that's in the word, too. Oh, yes. Faith without love is a terrible-headed monster that uses the word not to cut the enemy, but to cut one another. What? You didn't confess the word, and you weren't healed? Well, if you were like me... Yeah. Get the message? It stinks. And as the prophecy said, where's the sweet-smelling savor? That's a stench in the nostrils of God because there's no love behind it. Amen. Well, we leave that church. Rosalie says to me, I need more deliverance. What? So we sat her down, and guess what? Here we go again. Lord. You know, and God's trying to deal with me with my impatience. Ah. Lord. I think I got the message of suffering. I'm going through a few. And then I start studying this. What is wrong here? Why are we picking up these things? And the Lord begins to reveal to me. Proverbs 11, 1 says, A false balance is an abomination before the Lord, but a just way to think the light. And then, there's the scripture, The graven images of their gods shall you burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein, for it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. And I come across the word abomination. There's really nothing else in that scripture that really hits me concerning Proverbs 11, 1, except the word abomination. All right, keep reading. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. A fourth balance is an abomination before the Lord. Thou shalt neither bring it into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. And you know what the Lord showed me? The things which are a curse to his people is an abomination to him. We went to the church, we absorbed the teaching, and we brought it into our house. Not this house. Getting quiet out there. That's the word of the Lord. And we absorbed out of balance, and then we expect to come away from there, quote, normal, balance? No. That's why so many unbelievers can't understand what's happening in Pentecost, what's happening in Charismatic Renewal. Because they go to one church, and man, they got one tangent perfectly down. But everything else, where is it? The Bible says God's building a body, not a monster, not a freak. Not with one hand like this, and one hand that's dragging along the ground. Not with a hunchback yelling sanctuary like Quasimodo did. No. He's building a body that's normal. A bride that's normal and balanced. And unless we take the word of God and balance it, it's not pleasing in the eyes of God. But more than that, it's a curse to his people. This is heavy, folks. I don't expect you to get it at the first bounce, but don't throw it out. Chew on it. If you don't like it, spit it out. That's your will. You can do whatever you like. But if you see this truth here, beware. Well, Brother Frank, how do some of these things manifest in the church? What, what is some of the problems? Well, let's take some of this teaching that's going around and show you how out of balance it really is. Now, before I say anything, let me say this. There is a balance to everything in the Word of God. I believe in prosperity. And that's the one I'm going to hit today. Because some of you have confessed prosperity so long, and confessed this and confessed that, and it hasn't happened, and you're disillusioned. And I'm going to try to give you, in just a few minutes, the balance to that. We know 3 John 2, that you may prosper as you show prosper. John 14, 14, ask anything in my name and I will do it, etc., etc. We can go through all the scriptures. But I want to tell you, the Lord's trusted me financially. Financially, spiritually, in the marriage with my child, He has trusted me. I'm even going to tell you how. I have needs. I have needs. And there are needs which are very normal. Cars, homes, financial matters, whatever they may be. 
The Bible says to light yourself in the Lord first. And give you the desires of your heart. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things shall come unto you. Does it not? I was delighting myself in the Lord. My wife was. We rejoice when we pray to him. Rejoice to be called of him. It comes time I need a car. Very carnal. Very matter of factness, but Lord, living in the world, I drive 24 miles to work, and I can't hitchhike. Well, I guess I can if I want it, but I feel you want me to have a car. Lord, and you know what car I'd like? Let me tell you the story. And this, this is what really gave me the faith to do this. I have a cousin who, when he first started in the ministry, this is uh, my cousin who's the International Evangelistic Director for Cops of Christ Incorporated. Let me turn it over. Uh, he said to me, Frank, he said, you know, I was driving a piece of junk. I mean, a truck saw to it that my car had a new shape, accordion style. And I literally had to get piano wire to hold up my rear bumper to prevent it from dragging along the ground. And I knew God had something better than that. So I said, Lord, I know you call me to full-time ministry, but God, I'm going to be honest with you. I need a car. And I don't have the money. My settlement to the accident, accident is going to take years. You know, red tape in courts today. I need a car. Now, he had a small congregation at the time, about 75. And someone who wasn't even part of his congregation calls him up 13 months after he said that prayer. That's enduring for a while. Hallelujah. <laughs> he picks up the phone. Hello? Who? Oh, yeah, I remember you, yeah. What? God told you what? To buy me a car? Now, you know what he said, Frank, let me give you a little wisdom. When people come to you and say, God told me that you have to buy me a car, that may not be God. <laughs> but I want to tell you something. If they come to you and say, God told me that I should buy you a car, that's God. <laughs> And you know what he told me? He says, Frank, I just didn't want any other car, too. He was, he was fussy, you know. He says, Lord, I'll take anything. But if you're going to give me a car, can I tell you really, really what I want? I want an old cutlass. I want it royal and midnight blue. White interior, white vinyl top, and the work. Power steering exit. I want the whole work, Lord. So the, he says to the man, well, he says, what, what should I do? He says, well, how do you, what do you want me to do? And the instruction was, Go buy a car. Just go buy a car. He says, well, do you want to buy any car? The man says, no. The Lord was very specific. I'm only sure I heard the words, Oldsmobile Cutlass. <laughs> God. Now, this was in September of 1976. And the 77s have just come out. So he says, well, what should I do now? He says, the 77s have come out. Do I wait for a car? He says, no. Go down to the lot and buy one right off the lot. What do I do when I buy it? Just go down, sign your name. You'll have the money. Don't worry about it. Okay. So he got his little map out, plotted where the three Oldsmobile dealers were next, uh, you know, around his um, uh, house in Long Island. And he went to the first one, and he realized that he couldn't buy and wait for a 77. It just would take too long, and he's going to go on the road immediately. He figured the best thing to do is buy a leftover 76. He could save a couple hundred dollars, too. So he did that. He went to the first one. Says, uh, okay, I'd like to buy a 76 leftover uh, on your lot. 76, oh. We had to get rid of them to make room for the 77. Oh. You have none? No. You don't have one? No, we don't have one. You don't have one or two deal cut on the spot. Not one. Goodbye. Goes to the next place. Walks in the door. I want a 76. We don't have any. Not one? Not one. Lord, is this me? He looks on his map. Only one place left. Goes in his car. His bumper is being held together with piano wire. Drives to the last place. Walks in the door. Meets the salesman and says, I'd like to buy a leftover 1976 old cutlass. 
says, oh, he says, we, we don't have... Oh, wait a minute. 76? Yeah. Well, we have one, but we already have money on it. Or, or no, he didn't say money. He says, we already have someone interested in it, and they're going to come back and possibly leave a deposit today. He says, uh, what color is it? He says, well, look, he says, it's out there. And my, the way my cousin tells the story, he says, Frank, it was raining. I didn't want to go get wet. He says, so what I did, I just looked through the window, where it was, maybe 100 feet away. He said, only one on the lot. But guess what color it was? Midnight blue with a white vinyl top, with a white interior, with power steering, air conditioning, power brakes. Glory to God. That's it. I'll take it. Yeah. So the man says, okay, give me a down payment. Now we have a little difficulty. He looks in his wallet, and he's got all that money, $15. <laughs> you can tell he was preaching. And he says, well, he says, um, can I leave $15? He says, $15? Just that cost $6,400. You have to give me $100 or something. So he explained, well, I'm a minister. Someone called me, said they'll buy it for me. I can leave $15, but I can't leave anymore. And by tomorrow, I promise, tomorrow you have the money. That's faith. He says, let me talk to my supervisor. Went in there, and you know what the man came out and said? My boss said, if we can't trust the minister, who are we going to trust? <laughs> he says he called the guy up. He says, sir, I found the car. Okay. It's expensive. Well, how much? $6,400. No problem. God told me to buy you a car. And we're buying it. You meet me at the bank. 9.30 in the morning. We'll get the money. Pay it tomorrow. And as his word was, they went to the bank. He says his eyeballs going to come out of socket. He never saw some cash. <laughs> they took it in a suitcase. Went down there. Plopped it on the desk. Had the title that day. He drives home to his wife. He walks up the steps. Look at my new car. And you know what her face message was? Whose car are you borrowing today? Wives do that sometimes. So I figured, hey, wait a minute. If this thing works for him and God's not a respecter of persons, it's got to work for me. And I need a car. I mean, it's not, I'm not just being frivolous or capricious. I need a car. I mean, i got a need. God says to supply my need. Well, I'm going to trust you, Lord. Now, I'm going to tell you what I want. And we've been looking for this car for years, and it always seems just too expensive to afford. But I need something economical, and I want something sporty to go back and forth from work. I said, Lord, I want a Toyota Celica. You know, shot, bucket seat, AM, FM, cassette. Ask what I want, Lord. I'm a king's kid. Right. So we went to the first place, and there was the car. Beautiful. And when I saw the color, I said, that's my car. It had a British racing green. It had saddle can interior. And it was loaded. I said, that's it. But the guy wanted too much, and he wouldn't budge. If this is the Lord, I'm going to get it for the price that I feel I should pay, not that one. And even though it was a good car, had low mileage and all this, I wasn't looking at the car putting my faith in it. I was putting my faith in Almighty God and that He was going to meet that need. That's right. I didn't get sidetracked because I saw something and my eyes went or going boring after material things. Uh-uh. Well, so we... And I'll tell you, we got the urge. We just got it. Like God dumped it in our hearts what, on Good Friday. And we just started looking by faith. We just went all over. Could not find a thing. My wife is getting discouraged. Frank, what are we going to do? Not only that, but it seemed that our Tuesday, our Monday night was going to be tied up because a woman who went to our church invited us over her home on North Rome Avenue in Tampa. So my wife said, Frank, what are we going to do? I said, okay, look, pick up the newspaper. And, and just start calling. So she saw the Air Basilica, 1976. And I wanted the 76 because I'm cheap. I wanted to put regular gas in it, not unleaded. Amen. So she finds this one. She calls up. She says, you're not going to believe it. I said, try me. I found a 1976 Celica. British racing green. Saddle tan interior. It's got everything you want, plus a cassette player. I said, you're kidding. He said, no. He said, how much does he want? Now, the, the guy at the lot wanted $5,200. I 
This guy wanted 44. No, he wanted 42. That sounds good. I said, but we got that dinner engagement tonight. She said, you don't have to worry about it. Because you know where his home is? On North Rome Avenue. What? Well, that's just one block away from where we're going to have dinner tonight. Don't tell me the Lord's not putting that together. The steps of a righteous man are still ordered before the Lord. We went and looked at it. We took it for a drive. And I didn't get uh, impatient. My spirit of perfection didn't rise up and said, better buy it now. Somebody's going to come and get it. You'll regret it. No, I trusted the Lord. I said, I'll let you know. God wants us to walk in assurance. We prayed about it. And I said, I'm going to offer him $200 less. And I have driven, I, I was the third owner of the car, and with 80,000, almost 81,000 miles on the car, I still got three of the original equipment tires on it. That was the blessing of the Lord. We knew it, and he paved the way. And it was having trust in him. Not circumstances. I could create my own circumstances. But yet, there were circumstances that were being dropped in front of us, and every step of the way, the Holy Spirit was just like, come on, here we go, we're coming, we're coming. And we fell right into the blessing. And the Lord has done it again. Just before I came here, I had to buy a car for my wife. Why did you drive too? And we decided, okay, I got, the, I got the urge. The Holy Spirit just, I felt, spoke to me. It says, time for another car. Okay, Lord. Now, our family cars got to be a little bit bigger because of the traveling we do as a family. So I couldn't get an economical car. Or one as economical. So we started looking. He says, if this is the Holy Spirit, he's going to put it together just like he did before. And he did. This is even more incredible than the first one. I'm looking through the paper. And we decided what we wanted for a family car. And it had to be economical too. So we decided we wanted a Barnabas. And a small engine was fairly economical. Let's get after that. But one car in the paper, as I was sitting down one night, the Lord said, call him. I said, Lord, too much money. I don't want to spend that much money. Too much. So it's $6,000. I don't have that kind of money. Call him. Lord, I don't want to spend that. Call him. It's 25 to 11. Call him. You know, when you argue with the Lord, call him. Okay, I got the message. For the purpose of appreciating this story, my name is Frank J. Mandolia. Just remember that. I call up this guy. I tell him I'm interested and I want to come over. He says, all right, what's your first name? I, I said, Frank. He said, your name is Frank? Gee, that's a coincidence. My name's Frank, too. Well, you know, one of those coincidences. He said, what's your last name? I said, Mendolia. He says, does that begin with an M? I said, yeah. She said, that's funny. My name begins with, my last name begins with an M, too. He says, your middle name wouldn't be Joseph. I says, I don't believe I'm getting all this from just a newspaper ad. And you know that broke all the ice? He start, we started liking each other immediately right over the phone. And a car that cost so much money and that I called a couple of dealerships who, uh, who's, who I knew, uh, knew about cars and says, this guy wants this much money. And you know what they said? Better take it. And when I drove the car, you know what the Lord, you know what this man told me? He don't know me from Adam. But listen to what the Holy Spirit was doing. He said, I want to tell you something. I don't know why I'm going to say this, but there's another man who's interested in my car. And he's trying to get financing. But somehow, I want you to have this car. Oh, glory. <laughs> Woo! I said, well, thank you. So we went, my, and my wife, you know how wise those be. And I'm not supposed to give on to their life and car, and I'm getting jabbed in the elbow. Come on. Don't let on your life and car. Don't let, don't say a word. And my, and my daughter's going. <laughs> now, I figured that even if I couldn't get this guy down, I would be in a perpetual doghouse when I got home. So we stopped at a quickie eat place, and we started praying at the quickie eat place. And I said, all right. She said, look, do you want the car? I said, nice. Do you want it? I said, yes, I do. Good. Go, go call him. I said, Wait a minute, Rosie. Don't be so impatient. Don't give me impatience. Don't call him. Let's pray about it. So I prayed. 
And the figure that I got to offer him was $500 less than what he wanted. And the Lord said, to you because that receiver is going to slam in my ear and we're not going to get it. What I want to tell you, the Holy Spirit said, you offered that price. $500 less than what he was asking. And the car was like brand new. It's like he kept it in his garage just so I could come walk and buy it and not have to pay the new price for it. You know what I mean? Like, I have enough nerve. Called him. I said, Frank? This is Frank. We like the car and uh, we, uh, we like to make you an offer. And if you don't like the offer, we understand. I said, but I feel led that this is what we should pay. I told him the price. Five hundred, and, I, and I said to Rosalie, I said, honey, I feel so uh, assured in my heart that the Holy Spirit wants me to pay this price that I, I won't budge. I, even if he says, well, let's split the difference or something like that, because I won't budge, and I'll lose the car. I'll, I'll, sacri I'll even take the chance of losing it. That's how sure I am that, that God told me this price. So you, you do, you're the head of the household. And that's one thing she you don't make decisions for me. You hear me, women? She let me have it. After we discuss it, after she puts in her input, my daughter gives me her input, I gotta make the decision. Now we know that women have the power of influence, but they never she yourself. So I said, Well, here's the figure. She said, Oh. Well, can we split the difference? That is then there and says, why don't you just come up a hundred dollars and says, because I had some and you know what this fellow did? He even went down to the buff and polish shop, he buffed the car for me and cleaned it. I didn't have to do anything when I got it. I said, Frank, I'm sorry, I said, that's the price. Now if you don't, I understand. He said, Okay, I'll take it. Do you know what happened? On the Monday that we closed, on that car, he came walking in the bank. Please turn the tape over. Thank you. And it was his title. And he said, you don't know what you did. I said, what did I do? He said, just after I hung up the phone with you, the man who couldn't get his financing called me back and says he finally got the financing and you cost me $395. The timing wasn't right. Tell me God wasn't in it. Sure he Because he's watching over. It's beautiful. We knew the Lord was in that. Isn't that prosperity? Of course it's prosperity. And it's something that's very real. Not something spiritual or intangible and we're trying to get a hold of it. It's something all of us know because we probably could stand and give own testimonies of the Lord doing the same thing. I remember when Rosalie first hit me with the prospect of a swimming. Rosalie, please. Look at the starving people in India. Look, look, look at the Aborigines. Africa. Money for a carnal swimming pool? Carnality. You heard that preach for us. She goes, why don't we just pray? Pray. I tell you what God's going to say. You don't have to. I can tell you what God's going to say. Go say no. Let's pray. He's going to say no. Well, let's pray anyway. All right, we'll pray. But my prayer was like this. Lord, uh, if there's a word, you make sure you give it to me. Because I should probably say, let's say it to the Lord. Let's get one. Make sure you give it to me, Lord. Was it, what did I show my ignorance? So we prayed. Well, the Lord heard my prayer. He gave it to me. You know what he said? I'll give you the desires of your heart. Tell me the truth. I'll give you the desires of your heart. Lord, is that you? I said, what about the starving people in Africa? What about the Aborigines, China, and all the other stuff? He says, Frank, uh, I still can give you a swimming pool and food. Okay, Lord. Uh, now, uh, now, part B. We're looking at a vinyl job that's off the ground, a vinyl job that's in the ground, and then the super deluxe model, concrete, gunite, the whole bit, with a little diving board, all that. Now, is it A? Is it B? Or is it C? And if you change your mind, you can say, D, none of the above. I won't be offended. He said, I'll give you the desires of your heart. You mean I can get I can get the Cadillac? You can get the Cadillac model. You won't be offended. I won't be offended. Go get it. Wow. You sure? Positive. 
never come under condemnation. You know, we could have justified it to us. Well, well we, uh, of course, God wants to have a swimming pool and always rationalize a big baptismal tank. But it was the Lord who told me again, is that prosperity? Yes, it is. And I'll tell you something. Every decision we have to make with those two cars and the pool, God had to be in it because we never were in debt on any purchase. God spoke to us to get out of debt, and every time he was in it, I never took a bank loan. You hear me? I knew God was in it without a shadow of a doubt. What about the preacher? Now, let's, let's look at this prosperity thing. What about if you're in the ministry now? And your building is getting too small. Sound familiar? This happened to a real preacher. And he says, Lord, I got a need. I really got a need now. I need property. I need buildings. I need everything. And as he was driving down the highway, God showed us something right off the highway that was beautiful. Oh, it had acreage. It went in. It went out in every direction. And he said, that's your son. They'll sign out. And this fella had so much faith, he stopped his car, took the keys out of the ignition, closed the door, walked up to that for sale sign, pulled out of ground, threw and say, how dare you put a for sale sign on my property? Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! He went down to the real estate office. He said, I'm pastor so-and-so. I have this congregation here. We're expanding. We want that property. I'll buy it for 75000 The guy looked at him and says, look. I won't waste your time. You don't waste mine. Let me give you the scoop. That property is not worth $75,000. It's worth $225,000. And it's reduced from a quarter of a million. Now, we had a man in here just two days ago who offered 150000 twice as much as what you're offering, and the owners, which is the board of directors of a very large corporation, said, forget it. Now, you know, the average Christian at this time would be so discouraged, he would pack his bags and go home. But not when, the, not when you know you've heard from God. And he stood there and said, look, Buster, I'm here in the name of the Lord. I'm going to pay 75000 That's going to be my offer, and that's my property. Call them. I'm not even... And then the man said... You gotta appreciate the real estate man too. He says, "Look, I'm not gonna waste a long distance phone call because I know they're not gonna take it." He says, "I'll pay for the phone call. Just call them." Now listen to this. This is incredible. It just so happened. Isn't God how it works? It doesn't. It just works in those just so happened instances. The board of directors of that corporation was discussing how, what they're going to do to take an appropriate tax loss to justify all that profit that they made. And this guy called. And you know who, and it just so happened they're meeting that day, and not the secretary answers, but one of the board of directors picks up the phone as they're having their meeting. And if this pastor said, I'm pastor so-and-so, I saw the property on highway so-and-so, I'd like to buy it for 75000 He said, just hold on just a minute. Hey, we got somebody here, we can sell that property for this, we can take a tax loss, it'll offset this, and we'll come out, we'll have to pay income tax, what do you say, guys? You know, went, yeah, go ahead and take it. Sold. <laughs> God does provide our needs. However, without balance to that, we can get off the track. You see, prosperity is a blessing when God is first, but prosperity is a curse when prosperity is first. Do you get the distinction? You say, where'd you get that, Brother Frank? Well, that's from... The book of Mendolia, verse one, verse one, okay? But here's what I'm going to show you from the Word of God. Let's look at some people who are prosperous. Abraham, David, Solomon, right? Come on now, they, I mean, uh, I had one fellow do a study, and he combined just what it cost to build the temple, and I think it was six times the gross national product of the United States. That's what I call wealth. But now let's take a balanced scripture to that. Let's look at Lazarus and the rich man. The parable story. The end of that story is the rich man's not in heaven. He's in hell. The poor man, Lazarus, is in heaven. Well, wait a minute. What about prosperity now? Well, the story is that the man was so prosperous, he couldn't extend his arm to the poor. And by the way, God has blessed me with riches because he knows I give of my riches. 
I'm one of those people who don't come under the curse due to not tithing because God showed me that's one thing I do. And I tithe and then I give. Uh, we, we just, the other day we filled out the income tax, I guess it was a couple months ago, I decided to just look at what I, what I, uh, the Lord allowed me to pay, and it was in the teens of percent, not just 10%, it was in the teens. And this has been going on for a few years, so I know the Lord's going to bless me. But now we have the rich man in hell, Lazarus in heaven. Now how about the rich young ruler? Oh, isn't it something, that balance to prosperity? The rich young ruler who came to Jesus, even by, nay, uh, even by day and not afraid as Nicodemus was by night, who came to him and said, Lord, what must I do? He said, so all your things. What? I notice he was a rich and young ruler, which means the riches he made wasn't his own, it was his father's, his earthly father's. And he inherited it. Now, here comes the, the choice. Divest himself from the thing that his father gave him in order to obtain the true prosperity from his heavenly father. He couldn't do it. Is prosperity a blessing in that case? Hmm. What about the prodigal son? The prodigal son had all the prosperity. But his blessing was poverty in that pig pen to make him realize that his true prosperity was in God. Do you see that? Yeah, there's some real prosperity as long as we keep it in balance. There's real prosperity as long as God is, and as the Bible says, Jesus should take all preeminence in all of our lives. But it will certainly be a curse and a snare unto you if it's not. When we heard a, a tape from a dear brother, he came up against this subject and he says, you know how the Lord has just fitted in with me? He has balanced Philippians 4.19 but show, by showing me that God supplies all your needs but not all your greeds. In fact, if you want to find a scripture that balances this all out, it's this one. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food that is my portion, lest I be full and prosperous, and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? For lest I be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. That puts it into context for us, doesn't it? Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9. So there is a balance to that. There's a balance to having prosperity, and there's a balance to not having prosperity. But you know what I find in Christian circles? Now, wait a minute. Look at Brother Frank. Look at him. Got these cars. This home. Oh, ha! I can have it too. Uh, ain't necessarily so. I don't know where you are in God. Have you given like I've given? Has God brought you through the tr trials and tests to learn what I've learned? Or are you just going to grab a hold of one scripture, tie God behind the back and say, I'm confessing it. And God goes, okay, okay, get hurt. I'll give it to you. Come on. Let's grow up. In fact, this gets so bad... I can't believe, now you, now the subject is out of balance teaching and curses that come from it. That's the subject. And I hit prosperity because any time you flick on your radio, that's all you hear. I'm getting kind of nauseated at that message. I want to hear some balance to it. I want to hear a little bit of suffering, a little bit of brokenness, what people must go through in order to endure and to be made in the image and likeness of Christ. And because your hearts are there first, then God will give you all the prosperity you need. I went to one church. And I had an experience with, I, I won't name them, I'll just call them super Christian. You know, the big S tattooed on their chest. I go to the altar. I had a sore throat. And, I, and I'm an elder there. And I knew what the scripture said. So I'm kneeling. You know, before the altar. Lord, I'm telling you, brothers, I have a sore throat. The word says if I come before the elders, they'll pray the prayer of faith. I'll be healed and all that. Anointing their hands with oil. Just about to pray for me, and then all of a sudden, somebody comes over and says, You're not sick. I'm sorry? You're not sick. I'm not. No. Where do you come from? What do you mean I'm not sick? No, you're not. You confessed the wrong confession. Wrong confession. What do you mean it's a wrong confession. You said you're sick. The word says you're healed. Well, I said the word says I'm healed, but the word says if I'm sick, I should come to get healing. Did you ever read James and the elder bit? Oh, yeah, oh, well, okay. Backed up a little bit. Okay, people pray. 
Just as I'm raising my hands, just as I'm trying to enter into the Spirit, here he comes again. Super Christian. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to cast out a demon at a single word. <laughs> Lays his big hands on me and tries to shrink my head from size seven and a quarter to size five and three quarters. And says these words. I come against that demon of unbelief in Jesus' name, turn him loose. I don't know if I got up with the anger of God. But I got up and there was fire in my eyes. I said to him, okay, super Christian, now you listen to this. You sit on your bench. You don't pray for anybody. That's what the elders are for. I came to get healed from the word of God that says I can get my healing by submitting to the elders. You've got no right casting out a demon. That's not there. You sit down. You be a good little boy. And don't say another word. I had the power to do it. I was an authority. And I only had it is because I was submitted to the authority that was over me. And then Super Christian says, Well, I was just trying to help, but I didn't know you were sort of had a demon. And then someone else comes up. Another elder and says, Super Christian, I've noticed that when you prayed for women, you put your hands on parts of their body that you shouldn't. Thank you, Jesus. Super Christian had more than one problem. You know why he had this deception? It wasn't entirely his fault. You know what was preached from the pulpit? And that, that's what we're going to bring back to out of balance teaching. Here was the message. The word says you're healed. Therefore, if you say you're sick, somebody has lied. You were Jesus. Guess what that did to the congregation? The word says I'm healed. If I say I'm sick, I'm a liar or Jesus is a liar. Huh. Do you know what I had to put up with as an elder? People would come to me with headaches. As a matter of fact, with a headache because of the sermon. And because they were so, so afraid to confess that there was something wrong, they came to me. I say, what's wrong, brother? I can't confess it. I said, well, I'd like to know what's wrong so I can pray for it. It'd be a bad confession. I can't say it. Well, how am I going to pray for you? See what I mean? We know that God wants us to confess the word for ourselves, to move into maturity, to move where we don't need people laying hands on us all the time. Sure. But there's a time when we need to submit one to another. If the gospel's always one way, where do we learn the submission part? We go around spiritual snobs saying, I can confess the word and it heals me and I don't have to submit to anybody and thus just breeds rebellion. And you've got your lone rangers who rode into the sunset on that white horse confessing it never to be seen again. I have, and you want to know something? After that sermon, it put people in such condemnation that two men came to me and had headaches. As soon as I hear, hear the word headache, my natural response is to break a spirit of oppression. And I would say about 90% of the time, 75% of the time, it goes. And I just went like this. Spirit of oppression, come out in Jesus' name. And the guy went, it's gone. It's gone. Brother, thank you. Give me a nice big hug. I just started scratching my head. He came to church to praise the Lord, to hear the word. How did he pick up oppression? Hmm. All right, forget about it. The next fella comes, another man. He said, Brother Frank, I can't explain this, but I have a headache. And I seem to got it during the sermon. Oh. Oh, no, Lord. During the sermon? You preach a message that puts your people under bondage and condemnation, they'll pick up plenty of headaches. That's not the love of God. That's not the message of the Lord. It's to edify, exhort, teach one another. Not to put them under bondage. We've got enough problems with guilt and self-condemnation without hearing it from the pulpits of America. This fellow had a spirit of oppression too. I broke it. He said, thanks, it's gone. I said, wait a minute, brother. He said, what's the matter? Pray for me. I got it too. And I did. You see, that message was coming, coming across and it was producing a curse. Proverbs 15.4 says, A soothing tongue is a tree of life. But perversion in it crushes the spirit. We have to get a balanced teaching to keep us balanced so we're not an abomination before the Lord. From the quiet looks in the audience, I can tell you've probably been there before. Amen.
said but true. Well, let's sum up this teaching on curses. And let's try to bring forth the necessity of breaking curses in people's lives and why it's important. Number one, we found that uh, curses block deliverance in people's lives. We've proven that time and time again. We cannot go on to the spirits because of the curse. And here's what God has shown me. Let's see if I could draw it for you and maybe you could be edified. And... Oh, I've got to be plugged in here. Let's see. Can you get that for me? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Let's try to show you what we found out this week. Curses start here. What a curse does, it gives the legality of the spirit under it to work. Let's say a curse of rejection. Okay? The curse of rejection may not re really be giving you the problem. Well, you know what's giving you the problem is the spirit from it. You see, even spirits need coverings. And when they get their legality from the curse that's over them. This is why some of your spirits have come back. Because the curse to it has not been broken. It's sort of like this. Here's the covering. And under it is the spirit working. You need to break the curse and then break the spirit. When you do that, you get the victory. If you try to break the spirit and not break the curse, it's, it could very well be an exercise of futility. What we've done here this week is show you the need for deliverance. A lot of you have obtained deliverance. Please don't go from here and say, I've been delivered. No. You've been delivered in a sense. But what it should do is motivate you to start searching for deeper things in your life. I can't counsel you one-on-one. -on -one. That's what's needed here. You've got to counsel one-on-one -on -one to see what that thing is in the life. Let's just stop here a moment. This is what we've all learned this week. Let's go back to this. Just look at what we've learned. Here was a woman, in fact, two women, who came to me through private counseling. And it wasn't now just look if we were the type of person that started down here. With personality. Obviously, had a schizophrenic personality. In fact, this particular woman had three other personalities besides herself. If we start there, we're looking at the effect and not the cause. We need to get the cause so we can get the effect, not vice versa. Look at this one. She had a baby personality, an evil personality, and other personality, and then the real her. Mixed up mess. But notice where that came from. <clears throat> that came from all these curses. Basically, the curse of mental illness, which under that was the curse of nervous breakdown, intertwined minds, and then there was another one, Beelzebub, and that was subservient to the one above it, which was a curse of physical and mental illness, which was subservient to two spirits, a medieval curse and a curse of Jewism. This one particular word, as we started casting out a spirit, all of a sudden the spirit said to me, oh, what do you think you're doing? I know you think I'm in here, but you can't test me up. Where do you come from? Oh, you know very well I do. I can see it in your eyes. You know who I am. That's a, definitely an English accent. I mean, pronounced. This child is in England. Hmm. He was born in United States. I mean, look at my accent. <laughs> and you know, we found out there were two curses from England. One was a Druid curse. Because she mentioned the name. She, you know, the this, this spirit got so scared when we started looking at it. She says, I know you think I'm from Stonehenge, don't you? Yeah, that, that gave us the thing. Stonehenge, what is that? A druid. So right there, we knew we had to break a druid curse. In fact, my brother Morris back there was the one who discerned it as he passed there the other night. And it was a confirmation. I appreciate that, brother. What we broke as we had her up in the room at private counseling was a medieval curse. She had both. Now, just look at this. Look how these curses work. 
Remember when we broke the curse on the Jew, who was a Christian a thousand years? This curse was an operation a thousand. Let's move uh, on. Another woman came, one who lives right here on the ground, and she had a similar type of deal. And along with, now let's get out, this curse of physical and mental illness had a partner in crime, which we called the role inheritance. We found that where there's gypsies or people in the occult background, what they do is they pray that someone in the heritage will be established in their role after they die. But what we, and we knew that that gave uh, the demons things, but we didn't know what. With the counseling of this other woman, here's what we found out. That there was a pact made between her grandfather, Gypsy, who placed the role in heritage, and as a result, there were several strong men who came to be. And it was like a council that was set up within it. The council was composed of these strong men, the son of Lucifer, and under him was subservient, and the, all, these cur all these are both curses and spirits. Each one here is a curse and a spirit. Curse of darkness, spirit of darkness. Curse of evil one, spirit of evil one. Curse of death, spirit of death. Curse of destruction, spirit of destruction. And we just came into that this week. Now notice this. Curse starts here, gives way to two other curses. After that, curse is under it, and then protect the spirits which are operating under the guise of the curses. That is revelation. Praise God for it. Now, a couple of you have even come to me and said, Brother Frank, since you put that on the board, I've been fighting a battle because I know I got that in me. And today we're going to start breaking things in that area. Before I go any further, I'd like to say that the demon listings that we've made are helpful, but are in no way complete. This is not the Word of God, okay? This is the Word as it's come to us, and it's always changing because we're coming into more and more revelation time. Use it as a guide. It will help you, especially if you have the big eye and small eye problems. Each one of these has been divided in a manner that you can understand. It begins with character changes, motivational effects, intro selves, moods and emotions, mind, and it, be, and it goes that way for both the superiority and the inferiority. And if we have cast out certain ones that are in that big eye, I encourage you, look for some more. Don't stop and say you've just been delivered. Look for some more, you'll find it. And you don't need me. You need one another. Can you say amen? Okay, we're going to stop right here because we're going to have some deliverance today. And I'll tell you what, I'm just going to leave this up here. You know what we're going to do? We're going to use this and we're going to come against things in people's lives. And if you think you've got it, just let it go. I heard something different here today. There are people who I could just cannot, you know, my time is up here. I cannot see in private counseling anymore. So I feel that you may need some special ministry. And I'm going to, I'd like to, for you to come up to the front. Ted, you're one of them. Would you like to come up, sit up here? Uh, would you like to go sit at the end so we can have someone minister directly to him? Okay, thank you. Praise the Lord. Uh, he's the main one. I'm going to ask Brother Jim, Brother Norm, Ashley, Glenn, Irma, Morris, Kevin, and other people. Uh, Dempsey, you here? Yeah. Where are you? Is Dempsey here? Okay, yeah, you'll be back. For those, those especially those to help in deliverance. And that, naturally your son who probably knows a lot about it. Okay, now... If you've got any one of these, and let me say this, if a curse or a spirit can't be broken, would you please go home and, and do a leaven hunt like we talked about yesterday and check to see if you have an object or something, something giving you that's blocking it? And if it's not blocking it, at least when you get delivered, go home and destroy it. You don't want that open door, okay? All right. Would everybody say this prayer after me? Father, in the name of Jesus, here I am once again. I want every curse and every spirit working under that curse to be broken. I want, in fact, to live for Jesus. And if there's anything in me 
that's hindering my walk, especially hindering conforming you conforming me to the image of Christ. I want it out. I come against Satan in the name of Jesus. I renounce everything he has done and he's trying to do. And I set my will against his. I command every demon spirit to leave me in Jesus' name. Especially, I renounce the following. Okay, people, go ahead and renounce it. Whatever you think you got, just go ahead. And for your ministers who are out there, if you get word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, please come up here and share that word with me. I'm not doing my thing. I want you, especially people, to make an effort to forgive. Especially if you have problems in rejection. Make sure you forgive. For you women, if you're wearing any jewelry, earrings, bracelets, and you sat here and could not get free, please take them off this time. <clears throat> Hey, we're going to begin. <clears throat> oh, just, Father, let this deliverance be even better than all the ones this week, Lord. Give our brothers here, all the ministers that are here, just give them more to our knowledge, revelation, Lord. Lord, we just ask you, supernatural discernment, we ask in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, I come against a druid curse. In Jesus' name. I come against a druid curse. In the name of Jesus. And I break it off the children of God. In Jesus name. I break a druid curse. In the name of Jesus. Come out of them in the name of Jesus. A druid curse. Out in the name of Jesus. Out. Turn her loose in Jesus name. Turn her loose in Jesus name. Skip go pray with him. Out in Jesus name. I come against a druid curse. In Jesus name. Curse of the druids. In Jesus name. I come against them in Jesus' name. I come against a druid curse in Jesus' name. I see you. You got to go. I see you. You got to go in Jesus' name. You can't hide from me no more. You can't hide no more, can you? That's where you're drawing your strength. That's what's causing all these problems, isn't it? Get out in Jesus' name. I'm going to need help up here. I'm going to need help. Dempsey, appreciate it. Morris, if you could come. We're dealing with a druid curse over that woman. She witnessed that when I mentioned it. It was her problem. Go ahead and break it. Now, the rest of you, just uh, there may be things happening now. Don't get perturbed. We know that when spirits go, they cry, they shriek, and they do all sorts of things. Don't let it disturb you, okay? You should be used to it by now. Druid curse, turn her loose in Jesus' name. Druid curse, turn her loose. Turn her loose. Turn her loose. Turn her loose. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, loose her and let her go. Get out. Stop it. Get out in Jesus' name. Stop it. Get out in Jesus' name. Your power is broken of the curse of Druidism in Jesus' name. Out in Jesus' name. Out in Jesus' name. Curse of the Druids out in Jesus' name. Out. 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 Get out of her. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out in Jesus' name. Out. Shut up and come out. Shut up and come out in Jesus' name. Get out. You can't stay anymore. She's going to serve Jesus. She loves Jesus, not you. You're not her Lord anymore. Get out. 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 Loose her and let her go. Loose her and let her go. Get out. Stop, stop faking it. Get out in Jesus' name. Get out in Jesus' name. Out. Curse of the Druids. Out. Out. Out in Jesus' name. Out in Jesus' name. Out in the name of Jesus. Get out in Jesus' name. Out! Your power's broken by the blood of the Lamb! Out! Out in Jesus' name! One down, a few to go. I want to tell you, people, God's in His place. We've just got this revelation this week, and that's no accident. Can you say amen? Praise God for His leading. I didn't know it, but the Holy Spirit did. Don't tell me demons aren't real. He just saw a curse broken. Now we got to get some others. Uh, Dempsey, uh, you, uh, have her renounce, have her renounce the spirit of Druidism, and then, I think that pattern is pretty good. Have her break a medieval curse. I don't think it's necessarily a medieval curse of infirmity, but have her renounce and break a medieval curse, and then any spirit that happened to be working under that, I'll be back.
This woman has had problems in the past. They come back and she's saying, what's the problem? What's the problem? I can't, what's the problem? Strong man, that's the problem. But we're getting it. We're getting it. And you know something? We're going to get more revelation as the Holy Spirit starts out pouring it. Now, we're going to get some others. Let's see. We come against a medieval curse in the name of Jesus. A medieval curse in the name of Jesus. Turn and loose God. Medieval curse in the name of Jesus. Lucifer in Jesus' name. Lucifer in Jesus' name. Lucifer, Lucifer in the back. Lucifer and let her go. A medieval curse out of her in Jesus' name. Out of her in Jesus' name. Turn that woman loose. Turn that girl loose. A medieval curse out. Out in Jesus' name. A medieval curse. Loose God's people and let them go. Medieval curse. A medieval curse out in Jesus' name. A medieval curse out in Jesus' name. We break the power of the medieval curse in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Most of us got free from that the other day. How you doing, honey? Hallelujah. She was one of our guinea pigs, but praise God, it's her deliverance that's helping a lot of you. Turn her loose in Jesus' name. Is that girl named Debbie? Okay, turn Debbie loose in Jesus' name. Out. Let's go. Medieval curse on the family line. Loose them and let them go in Jesus' name. A medieval curse. Out in Jesus' name. Out in Jesus' name. Out in Jesus' name. Okay, something else we got to do. All of you need to say this prayer. In the name of Jesus, I break any pact or covenant that my forefathers have made with Lucifer concerning me or my family line. I loose myself from such an agreement and I ask Jesus Christ to set me free. Now, you renounce the following spirits. They may not be there and they may be. Don't worry about it. I renounce the son of Lucifer the curse of death and destruction, curse of the evil one and of darkness, spirits of darkness, spirit of the evil one, spirit of death, and spirit of destruction. Okay, we're going to storm hell, people. I come against the curse of death and destruction in Jesus' name. I come against the curse of death and destruction in Jesus' name. Loose God's people and let them go. The curse of death and destruction come out of God's people in the name of Jesus. Loose them. Loose them. The curse of death and destruction out of that young man in Jesus' name. Loose them and let them go. Loose them and let them go in Jesus' name. Out. The curse of death and destruction, get out of her in Jesus' name. Get out of her in Jesus' name. Out in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Out in Jesus' name. Out in Jesus' name. Pray with us, sister. Go ahead. Dad, brother, pray with us. It's a curse of death and destruction. Okay. I come against the curse of role, demonic role inheritance in Jesus' name. I come against the curse of demonic role inheritance in the name of Jesus. The curse of demonic role inheritance in the name of Jesus. Turn God's people loose in Jesus' name. The curse of demonic role inheritance in Jesus' name. Lucifer, Lucifer, the curse of demonic role inheritance, get out of her in Jesus' name. The curse of demonic role inheritance, Lucifer, and let her go. Lucifer, Lucifer, the curse of demonic role inheritance, Lucifer, and let her go in Jesus' name. Out in Jesus' name. I come against a spirit called the son of Lucifer in Jesus' name. Loose God's people and let them go. Loose God's people and let them go in Jesus' name. The spirit that's called the son of Lucifer, you're bound in the name of Jesus. Loose God's people and let them go. Loose God's people and let them go. Loose God's people. Your false spirit of the angel of light, out in Jesus' name. Your false spirit of the angel of light, out in Jesus' name. Out in Jesus' name. Out in Jesus' name. Out in, Jesus name. Out in the name of Jesus. Looser. Out. Angel of light, get out in Jesus' name. Your false spirit of the angel of light, looser and let her go in Jesus' name. Loose these two women in Jesus' name. Out in the name of Jesus. Out in the name of Jesus. We come against the curse of darkness. Curse of darkness of the mind in Jesus' name. The curse of darkness on the mind in Jesus' name. Loose God's people and let them go. She's got to pray with us. 
out in Jesus' name. Curse of darkness of the mind, loose this woman. We adjure you by the Son of the living God. Out of her in Jesus' name. Out in Jesus' name. You false spirit of the angel of light, loose that woman right now in Jesus' name. We command you by the authority in the name of Jesus. Loose her and let her go. We break a curse of fear in Jesus' name. A curse of fear in Jesus' name. Loose God's people and let them go. Curse of fear in Jesus' name. Loose that woman and let her go in Jesus' name. Curse of fear. Loose her and let her go in Jesus' name. Loose her and let her go in Jesus' name. The curse of fear. Loose her and let her go in Jesus' name. Loose her and let her go in Jesus' name. I bind you and I command you to turn her loose in Jesus' name. The curse of fear. Get out in Jesus' name. Get out in Jesus' name. Loose her and let her go in Jesus' name. Curse of fear. Out in Jesus' name. Loose her and let her go. Curse of fear. Out in Jesus' name. Out in Jesus' name. Curse of fear out. Curse of fear out in Jesus' name. Get out of her in Jesus' name. I come against all baby personalities in Jesus' name. All baby personalities in Jesus' name. Out. Out in Jesus' name. All baby personalities in Jesus' name. Out in Jesus' name. All of the baby personalities. All of the baby eyes. Out in Jesus' name. Out. Get out of her. Get out of Pam in Jesus' name. All of the baby eyes. Get out in Jesus' name. Out. This is Curse of Fear. Curse of Fear, you still in there. Get out. Get out. Yes, you will. Don't tell me no. Get out. Get out. Out in Jesus' name. Out in Jesus' name. Goodbye. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm so glad that Jesus set me free. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. Now we're going to hit just a few areas in the occult. It's already late, and we got to move on. So this is going to be it for today. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.